Welcome back, Spin TV audience. We're back once again. We have the second half of the final round of the 2014 Steady Ed Memorial Masters Cup. I promised I'd bring another special guest in, and we have one, my good friend, a local to Santa Cruz, somebody who knows a whole lot about the course and about this tournament, Avery Jenkins. Welcome, man. What's up, guys? Great to be here. Thanks for having me. All right, we are on hole 12, the kitchen. We're gonna get this thing rolling. We've got a lot of really great action for you coming up, and Avery's gonna lend some really good insight. So, without further ado, let's get this thing started. Hole 12, the infamous kitchen shot, or the wind chimes position. Avery, what's the lore of this hole and why is it so special to De La Viega? Yeah, the good old kitchen. Um, the whole reason this uh, hole's named the kitchen is for the fact there's an abandoned refrigerator down this ravine just off the tee pad and uh, something you don't want to find on any kind of tee shot out here. And so Simon is gonna take a route that's pretty non-traditional He's gonna take a putter first of all, throw a massive Annie out over the fairway of 13 and try to get the side door. And uh, Ricky's gonna take a little more traditional route. Avery, tell us what's the advantage and disadvantage. Yeah, the straight shot's definitely a risky route, but it's more direct. You're trying to throw right at that uh, disc nailed to the tree. It's about 20, the basket's actually located about 20 feet off the base of that tree there. And you're really just trying to drop a shot through the branches and hopefully get a putt. Pretty really demanding, very difficult shot. And what you're gonna see right here with Skellinger is gonna throw the little hyzer flip and he actually doesn't get it high enough. And this is where the fridge comes into play. You know, you can get kicked, you can roll all the way down there and then you gotta grab somebody a beer from the abandoned fridge. And nobody wants to be down there, especially during this tournament. And Paul is gonna line up the same shot. He's gonna hit that gap. And I believe that is his uh, McPro Rock 3. It just gets a little drifty. You can see the wind carrying it off to the right, but it does stable out and he's gonna be long pinned. And this is actually where he is. He's closer to 15's basket, and he throws a nice little forehand up. No easier putt than that drop in for three. Ricky's looking at a big birdie putt right here. Yeah, he actually did filter through the branches quite a bit to get a look just outside the circle. Huge Ooh. putt. Huge putt for birdie. A birdie bonus on this hole. Anytime you'll take it. And this is not a uh, give me hole by any stretch, and uh, it's not a hole you're happy to walk away with a three. And you can see Simon... Not many people in the world can throw that shot, that big putter any with that kind of power. How does he do it? That was one shot he was working on in practice. He did try the straight shot a few times and he saw that just that big high percentage, big gap over the left side. And with a forehand, it's a really good shot, but with a big turnover putter, that's a shot he has in his bag and uh, he ex executed it perfectly. Now mere mortals would take at least a, a speed nine or 10 driver to throw that shot, but when you've got that kind of power, it doesn't make a difference. Hole 13, I-5, this is probably the this is probably a par four. Uh, and it's very tough because you've got to come up the gap towards where the camera is, and then you're gonna fade out to the right of the frame and duck under these row of trees to get to a guarded pin position. Unlike that shot right there, a little high, a little tight, not where you want to be, but a very fortunate rollout to the middle of the fairway. Yeah, like you said, this is a, one of the true par fours out here. Very difficult she shot, trying to get down the fairway, trying to get there long of the pin, and try really try to bring it back door to try to get you a look at a three. Now, you guys probably have heard by this point, but Ricky did manage to two this hole. He took that earlier gap that he was actually a little short of on this shot and had about a 40 footer that he can, which is an incredible, you know, you almost never hear of a two on I-5. One of the things you don't want to risk though is that early shot coming in there. You can get the skip to the pin, but a lot of times it'll skip left down in Oak, Oakville down there. Lots of poison oak, littered the whole entire ravine. The really the shot you're trying to play is very long, out wide, and let it get a late skip in. Trying to get like that late fairway out in the backside, and it actually lines up really nice for a straight slide approach. And uh, you're, like really trying to get is just a birdie three on this hole. Now with Simon and Ricky um, birdieing that last hole there within one stroke of Macbeth. So Macbeth gets the advantage of seeing everybody else and throws that beautiful shot. That's where you want to be. Executed perfectly. That was, that was the shot you're looking for. It's a big power thrower. You're trying to get long outside to the left and get a nice straight shot for the upshot. Now here's Simon, and we talked about this a lot on the last video of his inexperience in Ouch. playing this course, and that's one of those shots where you just want to go hyzer right. You need to stay in an easy area to get up and down, but Simon's a very aggressive player at the same time. 
Yeah, an I-5, you can't take this hole for granted, man. It, anything can happen on this hole that's really covered with a bunch of little hobbit trees guarding the basket. And uh, like that shot, you're just trying to slide it up there, get yourself a putt. You really just don't want to take this hole for granted. And you can kind of see what Avery's talking about off to the left uh, as Skellinger lines up his Annie with his putter. Ooh, yeah. that was a very fortunate kind of carry him, kind of gra graze the tree, kick to the basket, and uh, should be an easy up and down three. And uh, these guys have no problem making those shots 90% of the time. Something interesting to note at this point on the chase card, Steve Rico is 15 down, Johnny McRae is 14 oh, down. God. So you've got two guys on the chase card that are either two or three strokes out of the lead. So this is not just a battle between the rounds we're seeing here. There's people sneaking up and trying to take this tournament as well. Especially with that miss by Simon Lazat. Wide, right, low. He's going to walk away with a bogey. And this is going to be his look uh, for five. He's going to take a five on this hole. And, you know, that's it's not uncommon to take a five, but I'm sure he's not very happy about that at this point in the round. And he's playing really well so far. And Paul's going to clean up. And we're going to go on to hole 14. Hole 14 is uh, it's in the D position, as you can see on the map here, 363 feet. And this is a tough pin because it's tucked behind where the fairway typically ends. And there's two routes. There's an underneath route that you'll see a couple of the guys throw. And then there's the big power over the top route. There's that low route that Ricky was looking at. Caught that inside left tree. That's a chance you take by trying to take the low, low gap. And then Skellinger's going to do the same thing, make the same tree. As, as small as it is, it's just right in the line, really well-placed tee pad. That, uh, Avery, you know a little bit about these tee pads. You helped with the installation and uh, uh, course development during Worlds in 2011. Yeah, this is one of the tee pads I really saw big potential out of, trying to drop it back lower down the hill, making for a little more difficult tee shot. And uh, we did just that, you know, kind of forcing two different gaps, the low gap, the high gap, and... Uh, yeah, it was, it was a lot of work, but it was definitely worth it for the 2011 Worlds. And you take a hole that is already very tough and just make it that much tougher. It's perfect for national tour level competition. Now you're going to see Paul here. He's just going to try to lay it up, and he's not really satisfied with that. He, uh, he would like to get a little closer and just to ensure the three at this point. Skellinger with a run for par is going to miss, and Wasaki lining up a big par putt here. That was huge. Wow. That was a big save, especially after hitting that tree off the tee. Simon with a big booming hyzer over the top of the trees and lines up a nice 25 footer for Birdie. Huge, huge potential, huge advantage. If you can throw over the top of these trees and get a punt on this hole, you got, you got strokes over the top of the field right now. It's just another one of those things where you see somebody with that caliber of arm and, and the different routes that they can take that may be a little bit different from what everybody else does. And Paul's going to clean up his three, and we're going to head on to hole 15. Hole 15 is 339 foot. It's another one of those new tee pads that was developed for 2011 Worlds. You're looking to throw an Annie shot if you're right-handed. It needs to pan out and get underneath the set of trees to even see the covered pin. And this is a hole that's gotten a lot tougher because the window is closed up to the left. Yeah, like you said, that was one of those new tee pads that we installed for 2011, trying to drag it back longer left, forcing a more difficult shot. Simon trying to put it over those trees and then bring it back underneath the branches of the second line of trees. Very difficult shot, very demanding hole. And Ricky's got an overhand shot that puts him in a good position. But he's he's going to be short of the pin. It's, it's really hard to just uh, not only get over right enough, but then penetrate far enough to have a look inside the circle. Paul leaves his off left. He's not going to be very happy with that result. And this is a nice little turnover by Tim. He throws such a smooth hyzer flip. It's really fun to watch his shots fly. Yeah, that was a, a really horrible shot by Paul, really kind of dragging it off left side. He's fortunate enough he actually did stay up on the hillside, giving himself an easy approach. And he does. He puts that where it should be no problem for him to make. Simon's going to run the birdie and just miss off left. And... Uh, uh, Ricky has about the same putt here from the other tree. Oof. Off. Nice run. It's a great run. He's really been on a spree of just hitting these big clutch putts. Uh, Skellinger is having a little tougher of a putting day on the other hand. Difficult Simon. hole. Difficult hole for these boys, especially just trying to drop in these pars here. Uh, no birdies. Like I said, it's a tough birdie, a very difficult hole to get on. And, uh, you know, you're lucky if you walk away with two on this hole definitely a great two to get and you're coming up to from a finesse hole to a big hole I call this hole the Avery signature I think the first time I saw Avery play in a tournament 
was on this hole and he threw it pretty much to 17's tee pad, which is a good 80, 100 feet behind this basket. It was just a huge mash. Uh, tell us a little bit about this hole. Yeah, this is one of my favorites out here. It's one of the holes you can actually air out really nice. Uh, 435 to this back right location. Um, something you really want to do, you want to kind of club down a little bit. You don't want to try to throw anything too high powered. Um, and you really don't want to go too long in this hole. Like you said, that, that tee pad of 17 is in the back in the distance, and there's a lot of trees kind of guarding the pin at that point. I try to step up to maybe a T-bird or a kickover eagle. Um, as you see right now, the crosswind left to right is really making these players struggle in this hole. Wind's kicking up. Uh, Dayla showing her teeth today. Yeah, he's got uh, Simon and Paul who have pulled over to the right, not got enough height on it. Uh, Scalinger there skips through the little mesh guarding the tree. Paul's going to have a little bit of a run at it. That's going to nestle nice and easy. Skellinger's going to pitch over as well. And Simon's going to give this one a little bit of a run, as as we come to expect from uh, his style of play. Oh, nice little bid. Nice little bid. Yeah, the players are just kind of laying up for threes at this point. Really tough to kind of get a get a stroke on this hole. Well, Saki actually has a look. Woo! Once it comes through in the clutch, that's a huge putt. Everybody's going to clean up the rest of their putts here. This should be pretty basic. And now we're going to a hole that looks simple from the tee. It's very short. Gravity, you really want to get this one. Yeah, this is one of the two holes that you need to birdie each and every round here. One of them being 8A, the other one being 17. It's a demanding hole, it's a challenging hole, but if you play it the way you need to play it, it's a very simple putter. Floating it down there, hitting hyzer line, catching the hillside, and checking up next to the pin. Now, it should be noted that simple and De La Viega never really appear in the same sentence, so there is some challenge here. You can see the slope is so steep that if you catch an edge on that disc, you can be rolling easily out of range. Simon's going to take his P2 and just nick the tree. That was looking like a clean line, just got a little bit high on it. Yeah, the players are really struggling on this hole for some reason. They're trying to throw that real touchy little hyzer shot. There's Paul catching the V-tree and then taking a big hit roll down the ravine. That's gravity for you. And what you typically see a lot of the locals do is actually play the hyzer shorter in front of the big V-tree up against the side bank that's off to the right side of camera, and then you trickle down towards the pin and still have a look downhill. Simon's going to take a long run. It's going to land. It will stay up, and that should be an easy drop-in for him. Yeah, it's difficult to keep these uh, discs on the side of this hill. You see a lot of action, a lot of rollaways, a lot of spinning, a lot of checking up. Paul for a par putt way over the top. And uh, it's, roll it's staying up on this hillside. Very lucky to keep that on the hillside right there. Paul's taking a bogey. Ricky's taking a birdie. Two-stroke swing on gravity. That's huge. And that will actually put Ricky up by two on Paul and up three on Simon going into a very touchy hole on 18. Now, Avery, you travel the country doing a lot of instructional clinics and you teach people the skills on upshots. What, what kind of advice do you tell people when there's a sloped green like this? Yeah, if you're gonna throw the ideal tee shot, like you said, you're trying to go up hyzer just in front of that Vici, chucking up on the hillside and then trying to carry back to the pin. Um, at this point, you're just really trying to match the angle of the disc to the angle of the hillside and just keeping it close, man. There's a lot of action on all those holes, and uh, especially this one on gravity. And hole 18 is one of those really tough holes. You've got to have such touch, and there's a huge drop-off, just like we saw in hole 7 on the front 12. Tell us a little bit about this hole, Avery. Yeah, this is one of the few holes out here at De La that you only have one option. This is the shot. This is the only shot. You're taking a straight to stable mid-range and kicking it over on a very extreme turnover trying to get it to skip, land out there, and slide to the basket on a very extreme drop-off. Simon executed that shot perfectly. I don't think I've seen a better shot on this hole at any point, especially not during a national tour event. Skellinger is going to get a little wide with his, but he'll be okay. And uh, this is a big moment for Paul, who's now down two to Ricky. And uh, after Ricky's hit the first tree, Paul's going to line up. He's going to be a little short, and he's going to leave himself about a 40-foot death putt in the truest sense of the word. Ricky's going to try to lay up here, and that's what can happen at Daylight. He hits the root. He will be okay. He's got about a circle's edge look uphill. Skellinger with a little slider up there. Easy par putt. And this is a huge putt right here. This, is, this could be the tournament. A true example of a death putt. Huge putt by the champ. Staring down a 40-footer looking at death. Hits the birdie. There's, there's nothing better to watch than somebody playing golf at that level. Ricky trying for his three, and he just gets an awful roll. That's 
That's getting Daylight in the worst possible way. And he's going to go down, decide to take the optional rethrow rule, which gives you one stroke penalty and you throw from your previous lie. So right now he'll be throwing for his five. And this is a big moment right here. You don't want to give up any more strokes. Wow, right off the top of the cage, up and in. That could have been easily a six if it hit the cage and possibly more if it would have rolled down the hill. Very lucky they actually went in. Good play on him by actually remarking and playing from the previous lie. But huge swing, three strokes. Paul McBeth with the two, Ricky with the five. We got some action here, folks. And Simon's also going to birdie that hole, and that's going to shift it back in favor of Paul. Paul will now have a one-stroke lead on Ricky and Simon at this point. And uh, if you guys will remember from last year, it was about this time where Paul McBeth turned it on and was able to come back from four strokes down to Philo and uh, take the tournament. So we'll have to see how he plays here, what is his strategy. Simon's going to have the box first on hole 19. It's a 324 foot. You need to sneak it between the trees, which are, is where the camera is snuggled between right now. And I uh, get up there for a look. Simon's going to hit an early branch and go off to the left. And uh, Avery, you had a special little shot from that position earlier. Yeah, I definitely did. Some point where you don't want to be caught up on that left side. Um, it's a lot of trees. You've got that road OB to the left side. You've got a really downhill drag right to the right side. This is another one of those holes that's a very demanding executed shot where you have the lace line, go outside the trees and the inside left, and then inside the island of four or five trees. And uh, you got to hit a perfect line to get a putt on this hole. And uh, it's only gotten harder over the years, more especially with these down trees kind of falling in the fairway. And Ricky is going to go too much over on the hyzer and drift out. He's going to have an up shot. He still leaves that one a little bit long. He can't be too pleased with the result of that shot. I'm not sure what Simon's thinking here. Trying to take it over the road. It's OB, a little backhand flip roller with a putter. Absolutely not the shot you're looking for on that hole. That's uh, not a high percentage shot for anybody, even somebody as good as Simon. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure you gave him a little bit of earful after that one. Yeah, just keep the disc inbounds, pull it off to that right side with a forehand roller and try to get up there for a par putt. Yeah. Trying to take it over the road, you're asking a lot, and uh, he definitely paid for it on that one. Yeah, he, he could tell he was upset. He didn't even wait for Ricky to pull out. He went ahead and cashed that. Uh, so Simon's going to take a five. Paul's going to take a two. Birdie. That's a great birdie. That's a, that's a take control of the round birdie right there. That's two in a row by Paul, really making a late run charge. Got four holes to go as we tackle the hill. Going up the hill. This is, of course, it has to be at the end of the round. When you're tired, when you've been playing in the wind, trying to deal with all the conditions of De La, now you've got to play just a few more shots uphill and downhill. Hole 25 is a big arm shot. Don't let the scorecard fool you. To get all the way up to this pin takes a lot of power. And you see Macbeth, the tournament could be resting on this shot right here. And that is just boom town. It measures 399 uphill. It plays all of 500 to get a shot up there on a hyzer line and to get it to stay on the hillside. Phenomenal shot. Paul pulled it off perfectly. And that's got to be the, one of the best shots I've ever seen on this hole and probably the best shot Macbeth has thrown on this hole and it couldn't have come at a better time. Ricky showing off the arm right here. That's a big shot. He goes past the pin, trickles down, and you see the chase card is right there waiting to see what the lead card does on this hole. Simon waiting to unload on this one all round. Slight inside left early. Somehow trickles through all that branches and debris, gets inside the circle for a birdie putt. And anytime Simon has a look is where he's dangerous. The range on his putter is, you know, one of the best on tour. Skellinger with a classic layup right there. Great job on the hillside. Ricky with a big run. He wanted that one. He almost cashed it. And here's Simon trying to make a charge. Slightly downhill, 28 foot and hands it. Never a doubt on that one. Paul looking at about a 15, 18 footer. Uphill, cash money. That's three birdies in a row, making the late round charge, taking control. He wants this tournament. And that for people that don't know, this is not a stretch of De La Viega that you're pushing birdies either. No, absolutely not. This is a spot where you're really hitting some fine lines, hitting 18, getting 19, and then the big uphill on 25. Incredible shots. The champs really letting that ring shine. You can really tell the practice and the preparation and just the willpower to win this tournament at those moments right there uh, as we go to hole 26. This is another really tough hole. A lot of the big arm pros are going to take a uh, power ante. 
Paul's going to take the Heiser line, um, which actually most of the chase card did as well, and he's going to get caught in a tree. Simon's going to take the big Annie, and, and what's hard to tell right now is the wind is pushing down the hill. So even though that is a, you know, that's that's a driver he's throwing with a lot of power, it's going to push all the way down the hill if you show the underside of that disc to the wind. That's the high percentage shot in most cases when it's not windy, trying to get that big uphill Anheuser, getting it carry over. Ricky throwing it a little early, slight little glance off the branches. It did carry forward. That should give him a look at a putt. I think Paul was thinking more about the wind, thinking it's coming over the top of the hill, maybe take the straight shot, maybe a little hyzer line, try to get through the trees, and really just trying to get a three on this hole with this kind of conditions. Yeah, after you've uh, got three birdies in a row on a real tough stretch of the course, you put the work in, you can really take the hill a lot easier, and as Paul's gonna lay up, uh, just as Skellinger and Simon did. And here's Ricky for birdie. That was huge, that was huge. Knowing that Paul's making his charge, taking control of the round, Ricky's like, if I can birdie these last three, I can tie this thing up. And he's picked some tough holes to do it, but once again, the putter comes through for Ricky. Again, the reason he won in Texas was because of his putting, and he continues to show it here. Skellinger with another air ball for par, and he just, he's had a tough day, but you know, uh, Skellinger's the type of guy, he's never going to show it. He's always going to have a great attitude, shake your hand at the end of the round. He's he's a real pleasure, and you got to play with him in the second round. Yeah, absolute gentleman, sportsman on the on the course, and uh, yeah, he's one of the great ambassadors in this sport. I love to see him, and I love to play with him in every chance I get. Hold 26A, you're up on the top of the plateau here, and this is, uh, for all accounts, it's a pretty simple idea of a hole, but the wind can really change how this hole plays. Uh, the wind is pushing left to right on the camera so right to left from the player's perspective and you can see ricky right there uh his tail's off paul takes a mid-range i think it was a solid play especially with this wind you just want to keep it down the middle these players are throwing on a spine there's a drop off extreme left a huge drop off extreme right you're really just trying to keep it up on that top up on the flat if you get a birdie putt awesome in these conditions i think you're these players want to take some pars out here and here's what Paul Macbeth had to say about the wind today. But with these hills and these drop-offs and the drives you have to throw, it definitely became a factor for all of us. So later in the round, we were starting to get tired. The wind was a little more, you know, you could feel it a little more. You could see it affecting the disc, and it started throwing some down the hills. You see more bogeys towards the end, and uh, I, was, I was able to fight through it and get a few birdies on those windy holes. And, and yeah, it definitely uh, affected a lot of scores. And you can see Paul did almost birdie 26A when all he really needed to do was lay up. Ricky's gonna go just outside strong side for his par putt. Simon's gonna line up a par putt right here. Didn't look comfortable at all. It kind of set up, kind of off balance. You could tell by his just his body rhythm and his and his mannerisms that he wasn't gonna make that putt. It's tough, and De La is no easy course, so you can't play in these guys at this point for being tired and you know maybe making a few of the mistakes that you wouldn't see on an 18 hole course or a slightly easier uh, tournament course but you know everybody has really played solid anytime you can play three rounds under par at de la you're doing a phenomenal job and we're going to top of the world hole 27 one of those beautiful finishing holes in all of disc golf yeah it's an epic finish to an amazing course hole 27 overlooking all downtown santa cruz Monterey Bay, the Monterey Bay Peninsula in the background, absolutely beautiful hole. Yeah, and this is what Paul had to say. This is uh, three years in a row now. You're coming down from top of the world, a really tough hole. How good does it feel to not have to worry about your score, that you just play it safe? It's a huge relief. Uh, that top of the world shot is not a gimme at all. You got OB left, and you got trees everywhere that you can land in, stick in, bogey the hole. But uh, yeah, the feeling of not having to worry about it is just a huge weight off the shoulders and then just putting it out there in the middle and laying up. Really a testament to his perseverance and his will to win when he's battling with all these guys year in and year out and is able to take this tournament down three years in a row and not have to win it on the last hole. That's phenomenal play. Um, tell us a little bit about there's a lot of different routes you can take on this hole. This is the route you're going to throw if you want to keep it in bounds. Um, in his position, up by three strokes, do the big forehand out to the left, bring it back right, spike hyzer down there somewhere near one, maybe the tree by hole 27, and really just trying to look up for a layup three, walk it in. This is a victory you want to just walk away with, and uh, no point in forcing him to even try and put that OB into play. Now here, you, you took the forehand route on this hole as well and had a couple nice results. 
Yeah, no, it, I uh, had finished the turn him off the way I wanted to. I threw the forehand down there, brought it way more aggressive over the row, left side, brought it in late, and I got a really nice check-in roll as it kind of fed back to the pin and had a nice little 15, 20-footer to finish off the tournament. Simon trying to get a birdie here to finish off. and As perfect, he says. He really wanted that putt. Ending on a birdie, especially in Santa Cruz, is always a great feeling. Tim just off the cage. And Ricky trying to line up one last big putt. No problem. Finishing style, that's how you do it. Finish off the round, finish off the tournament with a birdie. Doesn't feel any better than that. And we're going to see some tap-ins here to finish out the round and allow Macbeth the courtesy final putt as he takes down his third Masters Cup win in a row. How huge is that? Yeah, Paul Macbeth, Wick, Ricky Wasaki to battle it out, coming down the last stretch of holes to, for the final win. It was changes from lead change, momentum shift, to two strokes here, two strokes there. Incredible watch these two great players battle it out. And then again, Paul Macbeth for taking it down, holding down this tournament, playing the best he can play on the Daylock course. Now we're about halfway through the season. Paul Macbeth has taken down two of the three NTs, Arizona and Santa Cruz, with Ricky taking the other one in Austin, Texas. Avery, it was phenomenal to have you here. Your insight is invaluable on in this course, and uh, we really appreciate you stopping by. Great to be here anytime, man. I love doing the commentary for these kind of videos and watching this great good disc golf coverage. All right, guys, thank you for checking in. We appreciate your support as always, and we really look forward and hope you'll tune in for the 2014 Japan Open. We've got great coverage coming from there exclusively at Spin TV, guys. Keep it locked.